point to sort of pursue that scorched earth devastation of lands that they were going to be forced to uh, to evacuate to to cease occupying. Um, so that was one threat. But of course, the the Allies also uh, needed to win the war, and uh, in in the Netherlands becoming a war zone exposed civilian population to those perils as well. So we have kind of twin um, floodings that occur during this time period. In the fall, the Allies flood uh, Walcheren, which is an island sort of the bottom uh, left, if you're looking at the map in Zeeland, that was deemed to be vital to uh, winning the Battle of the Scheldt, which would make uh, Arn or sorry Antwerp um, uh, the port of Antwerp available to the Allies to bring in supplies. So again, absolutely necessary to end the war. But the flooding of the Valkyren, in fact, resulted in civilians drowning uh, because of the element of secrecy uh, and, and uh, the importance of surprise. Uh, they all did not go according to plan and there were several fatalities involved there. Whereas the Germans uh, flooded uh, the Wieringer Meer in late April of 1945, so really for no good reason other than to be sort of bloody minded about it, but it did at least give the civilian population um, uh, adequate warnings so that there were no fatalities associated with that flooding. Again, not to give the occupying Nazis any humanitarian awards here, uh, they did recognize and even someone like Arthur Zeiss Inkvart, who is the head of state, if you will, of the occupied Netherlands, the Austrian who'd briefly headed uh, Austria uh, at the time of its uh, incorporation into the Third Reich in 1938, uh, was in charge in the Netherlands. And again, not anyone, not a candidate for any human rights uh, awards here in fact, would be executed um, following his conviction at the Nuremberg trials in 1946. But um, yeah, I guess it does have to be said in fairness that he did not carry out those wider scorched earth directives from Hitler and, and Berlin more broadly. Uh, so the flooding uh, element of the widespread disaster that was feared did not in fact come to pass. And in the broader context of that, uh, this is the um, liberation of the North uh, East. So you see Arnhem, um, Here's Nijmegen, which, which, which had been liberated in the fall. Here is the, the Wall River, here's the Rhine River, and here's Arnhem. And again, my, my mother was, uh, Ada is where my father was from. My mother is from uh, north of uh, Appledorn. So this is all very close to them. Uh, but the final liberation of the Netherlands, this campaign begins in late March. Uh, Arnhem is completely devastated in this campaign. Um, they, the Allies actually come in from the east uh, and the city is completely flattened. My mother remembers uh, people um, sort of harboring, taking refuge in her hometown, you know, wherever they could. She remembers that she came on, that they came on foot, uh, but their homes were completely devastated. Really, uh, Arnhem is the probably the most heavily damaged Dutch city uh, of the Second World War, probably rivaled only by Rotterdam at the beginning of the war, with of course the infamous bombing of Rotterdam in May of 1940. So uh, this resulted, of course, in the, uh, the liberation of the north and the east, uh, leaving just fortress Holland. Uh, so the, those western cities that I mentioned earlier, uh, those at the end of by the end of April were the only part of the Netherlands that had not been liberated. And in fact, they would not be. Um, there would be not there wouldn't be a battle for the fortress Netherlands. That was uh, something that was determined by the overall outcome of the war and the Germans surrender in early May. So the the Germans would simply have to evacuate as opposed to being uh, defeated there. In that context, um, so I, my, my mother's family is from north of Appledorn, as you saw on the last uh, map. Um, my uh, oh, my uncle uh, Herman, who was never really my uncle, of course, but um, he fought in the resistance and the resistance was organized to assist the allies. They wanted to participate in the liberation of their homeland. And uh, my uncle, as a young man of 22 years, uh, was participating in the resistance. And on the 13th of April, he and a group of uh, fellow resistance fighters were hiding near a bridge uh, on the Appledorn Canal, hoping to receive the Canadians uh, who were uh, marching through the area and were the, the armed forces that were responsible for, for much of this liberation uh, activity. Um, however, there had been a change of plans. Those plans had not been communicated. Uh, the Germans found out where they were. Uh, they were in fact wearing uniforms that identified them as uh, resistance fighters and in attempting to flee upon their discovery, uh, a number of them were shot, including uh, Hermann, 
and uh, others were rounded up and shot against a wall uh, on a, in a nearby home. Uh, this is known as the, the Clement Bruch uh, drama or, or um, disaster. 13 people were killed uh, in this incident, and as you'll note from the date of April 13th, 1945, just days before the end of the war, with, of course, life-changing uh, consequences for, um, for all the individuals concerned. And so the- Going uh, at the end of your time. Okay. Can I say just a concluding statement? I have one, one final. Yes, naturally, naturally, yes. All right, all right. So, so the, the, the liberation of the Netherlands was bittersweet. Um, the hunger winter had claimed 22,000 victims. And so the scenes of jubilation don't tell the whole story. Many were too weak to get up out of their beds to, um, to greet their liberators. And again, for those who had experienced the, um, uh, the, 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 the war up close and personal, uh, this I'll just say in conclusion. So I visited the Netherlands in 2017 and visited the soap factory that had been my grandfather's and saw a plaque there that no one seemed to be aware of uh, in memory of uh, Herman van Appeldoorn, who was expected to take over his father's business. Um, and so in honor and memory of what they called our future, our future director, our future boss, um, who was killed uh, in the last days of the war. And of course, being the good uh, uh, Protestant uh, that they were, quote uh, from Deuteronomy 4 verse 9, only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. And I had never seen this before. I had never heard about this before. And there I was, you know, at the age of 55, about the age that my grandfather was at the time that he lost his son, who was the age of my older son. So I, my, my wife and my two uh, children with me on that visit. And so Hermann was 22 years old, the same age that uh, my, my older son was at the time. So all the more uh, important to underscore while we do important archival fact-based archival research, never to forget the, the personal connections and the impact of these dramatic events on people's lives. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Now, uh, that's the period when we hope there will be some question from the audience. Please don't hesitate to say anything without any sign because nobody... How is um, I, ha I have a question, it's Daniela. Yes. Uh, so thank you for this fascinating presentation and uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, if you can talk a little about uh, being a, a historian that research his own family. If you can say something about that, do you see any benefits in it or, um, or anything? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, that's not, it's not something that I have done directly before. This is actually really the first time that I've talked as part of a scholarly presentation about this story. Um, and, it's, uh, but, and yet I would say that, that the, one of the reasons why I'm a historian is because of these events, that these events very much were a presence. Um, even you know, as, a, as a child, uh, being aware of the war to the degree that you know, a child can be aware of historical events. Uh, and the impact in the impact of that on 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 the family, uh, where we at the very same time, of course, of of the uh, the questions of objectivity, and um, and so while I'm trained as a historian, trained by the best, I got my PhD from from Yale University, and so I I, I learned and embraced the uh, the benefits of multi -arch archival research, fact based research. Um, see also an opportunity here, and I guess I would say I'm in a later stage of my career, to, um, to, to re-embrace the, the things that um, inform our passion for history and the importance of history uh, and the importance of connecting, uh, especially a massive event like the Second World War, which can easily overwhelm us with, with the statistics. Right, And even in the case of the Netherlands, where 22,000 people starved to death, 
which is a lot of people compared to one person, and yet minor in comparison to uh, the famines that, that affected uh, Bengal in India or Henan province in China, where millions of people died. Um, so, of course, the Second World War often confronts us with, with atrocities and, and catastrophes on a massive scale. And yet every, every death, every single death affected people in an important way. And so I think it's, it's, it's appropriate and um, uh, important to weave those elements of personal narrative in as, as, as occasions warrant. But thanks for your question. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Other question? If nobody else, I would um, like to ask something which is not directly to your lecture, but directly to a uh, question of Holland. That's uh, Netherlands, I mean. That, um, uh, as I know, traditionally, this society is described as a, a pillar society, the pillarization of the society. And because the religion is one of the uh, basic element of the of the pillarization i i would think that from the basis of this pillarization it's uh, uh, somehow in uh, in a, a kind of link between the pillars and the level of collaboration is it true or not could you could you describe uh, something uh, about um, the social and and the political and other groups of Netherlands? How their relations to the to the collaboration or uh, anti Nazi anti Nazi activities? Yes. Well, that's a very good question, um, of course, and a really important one. Um, and, and in reflecting on this, and again, this kind of goes back to the last question, sort of wrestling with this, did, did, did our family, I have an uncle, was, uh, my, my father's old, their oldest sister was married to a, a Rotterdam policeman. So, and I don't really know the story, but uh, but it w must have been if he was active in in Rotterdam's police force, he must have played a role in the roundup of of Jews uh, in in Rotterdam in 1942 and and following. Um, and so the it, it, I think it's certainly very Im important to cite the, uh, the 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 religious factor in terms of the organization of Dutch society. I would say that somewhat in parallel to Germany, uh, the the church institutionally failed um, in its greatest test because presumably uh, the 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 persecution and and mass murder. I'm using I don't want to use the word genocide because you know historically it was evolving at the time, but of course that's what we certainly would call it now. Um, failed, right? That the the the, the church. And uh, the Roman Catholic, whether it's the Roman Catholic Church or, or the Protestant um, church, churches in the Netherlands, uh, failed institutionally to, um, to, to put up uh, effective resistance to what the Nazi program was uh, in terms of the Holocaust in the Netherlands. And so I guess that kind of leads to the point that, that while there are those pillars and they are important, uh, in the end, decisions to do uh, to carry out acts of resistance certainly uh, required sort of an individual, it was a matter of individual conscience, certainly informed by the institutional church, but not organized, uh, broadly speaking, by the institutional church. And so, uh, again, you can look at Queen Wilhelmina and say there was a sort of a stalwart, good, devout Christian, pious Christian woman, and her example was certainly very important but in terms of the, the organization of society and the potential of institutions to uh, resist where uh, a, a matter of, of fundamental human rights was, 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 was broached, um, that, that, that is the big disappointment. Mm -hmm. is that, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, may I, uh, may I ask my question a little sharper? That mm -hmm. uh, if we see the East European um, uh, churches, 
they are they were uh, we wouldn't say that it they don't uh, support the um, uh, anti nazi movement but we have to say that they support the nazism in several ways uh, practically uh, almost every anti semitic action except the the real holocaust was supported by the churches what was the relation in that meaning so so the antisemitism or the uh, christian antisemitism was a was a real uh, a problem in the pre war netherlands or uh, or in that meaning in that time it was a um less anti-Semitic tradition in, in that, in that churches. I would say so less, uh, so, so sounding like an apologist for the Netherlands, but I do think that you can make a strong case that um, the Netherlands, which had granted uh, civil liberties to its Jewish population since the late, um, uh, since the early 19th century, late 18th century, um, did have a tradition of, of, if you will, tolerance, um, and that there was, I would say, in marked contrast to, because of course in Germany you see the Lutheran Church completely, completely uh, co-opted by, uh, and I don't want to say co-opted because it sounds more passive than it was, uh, in terms of uh, sort of ab adopting the Nazi agenda. That is not the case, I would say, for the, the Protestant churches in the Netherlands by and large. While I think they're, they're um, their failings in the face of, of the trial of the Holocaust um, were more sins of omission than commission. They did not uh, embrace Nazi ideology. Um, and again, Wilhelmina would have been a, a good example of that and an important leader in that respect. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Is it, excuse me, yes, I, I have one uh, question. But uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Perenbaum about those uh, Dutch uh, citizens who, who joined the, the German SS. Uh, what happened to them after the war? And uh, what is their place in the, in the memory of, of, of Holland during the Second World War? Yeah, um, so don't have a super specific answer to you, but certainly in terms of the memory uh, seen as traitors, you know, Anton Mussert, who is not, uh, who was the head of the Dutch Nazi party was executed um, in, in uh, May of 1946. Uh, the, the young men who, and I have a number here who signed up for the, um, for the SS, uh, they were, they were, of course, as, as often happened, um, so 20 to 25,000 Dutch men joined the Waffen SS. And of course, a number of them would have been, a significant number of them would have been killed. They were you know, sent off on uh, fool's errands, if you will, from a military standpoint, certainly towards the end of the war. Um, but, but definitely uh, pilloried at the end of the war and, uh, and seen as traitors. Um, uh, people who had belonged to the Nazi party, uh, in fact, again, from my, I, this is from my father's home, we have a painting by a, a Dutch painter who was pretty celebrated in the 20s and 30s, uh, but who joined the, 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 NS, the, the Nazi party. And again, that's different from the SS uh, specifically, uh, but spent time in prison at the end of the war. So people were imprisoned for having served or having joined the Nazi party. So it's definitely a, a kind of a, um, a purge at the end of the war. And um, again, the numbers were such that I think you didn't face those same kind of dilemmas that, that, that within Germany, for example, uh, you'd have to kind of rehabilitate people who, you know, on the face of it, were, were guilty of some pretty egregious crimes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can we move yes, to another lecture? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin.